Oh wait, am I supposed to talk into this? Yes. Uh, that sound. Can you all hear hear us in the back? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I love it. Um, as I was saying, thank you all for coming out tonight uh, to meet Tom Dixon, uh, one of the designers. I think of when people ask me, you know, looking over your super long and harrowing career uh, covering design, you know, who are the designers who really changed the game, who did something, who made their mark in the world uh, and established their own sort of language. And I think of Tom Dixon, and I'm only sorry that I don't get to London as often as I used to, um, to check in on the work of the studio, but it's a thrill to be here, and thank you to Lumens for um, putting us together. I guess I should say, as uh, a Brit, um, I share the condolences of the American people um, on the death of the monarch. Um, I was told I should mention the poor queen passing, so there you go, Tom. Condolences. Well, well, thank you. I mean, it's a bit awkward to kind of represent uh, <laughs> this moment, right? But I've been astonished by how many people are interested in the royal family. And of um, course, what a life, what a life, yeah. you know, and, you know, it's left a, a huge void, right? Yeah. I'm not a, a monarchist, but it still feels empty uh, well, without um, her, right? Everything and, uh, seems to be changing in the world sure. these days in uh, both fascinating and terrifying ways, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting moment to look back as well as look forward. And uh, as we celebrate 20 years of uh, your studio, the opening of your studio, you have an exhibition that's traveling. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about the, about the, the exhibition? Yeah, I mean, I resisted uh, looking back. I was, you know, I, di I didn't want to do 20 years. You know, it's an it's a artificial, you know, uh, number, I guess, but, you know, I was convinced to do it. And of course, uh, it was an opportunity to, I guess, upgrade some things. I think all too often in design, uh, you try and make something perfect and, and you leave it alone. But that doesn't happen in electronics or cars or, you know, so I took the, the opportunity to uh, upgrade some things, look at some things which I felt were contemporary and also talk a bit about what we're doing next as well. Uh, so what are the constituent parts of the exhibition? I mean, were there, was it like choosing among your children to see, you know, to see <laughs> who would make the cut for... No, listen, you can't choose your children, right? You know, this I, is not allowed. I don't have okay. kids, so I never had to <laughs> make that choice. Okay, no, I mean, I, I, you know, I, 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 you know I, I live with dissatisfaction with everything I've produced. I'm always wanting to, you know, to change it. So it was a good opportunity to, you know, do some things which have got a relevance today. I mean, obviously, you know, sustainability, the big, big topic, you know, in, in this very, very hot state um, was, uh, was something that we needed to look at more. So it's an excuse to do that. Um, and experiment in a few um, ideas of materiality and functionality, you know, for the modern world, you know. Well, I'm so interested in the, you know, analogy you drew to electronics and automotive and all these things that are constantly being tweaked and changed mm -hmm. and upgraded. Um, and you mentioned that it was an opportunity for you to look at some of the work. Did you make changes in how things are made or material? Uh, you know, what was the outcome of, <clears throat> of, of surveying this incredible body of work? Well, I mean, some of it was disastrous, which is always the way when you experiment. So, you know, the SJ, which is probably the, the, the object that's followed me around my career the, the longest and, and has, has, um, has come out in several versions, I, I decided that I was going to make it in latex, you know, a, a, a forest uh, plastic, effectively, latex being from the rubber tree, yeah. and make it inflatable so I didn't need to use petrochemicals in the, f in, in the comfort parts. And um, it was it's the most ugly object I've ever made, I think, <laughs> but it was kind of interesting from its kind of, you know, I collaborated with a, a great uh, fashion designer in London that makes the, uh, 
the rubber wear for Britney Spears and for Madonna for her videos. And, and um, she'd never done a chair before. But, you know, it was, it was interesting. And I think often, you know, showing your failures as well is something that designers don't do a great deal if they can avoid it. But it was kind of liberating to show the mistakes as well. So the rubber, the rubber chair was, was, was done and, uh, and redone. We, we, we worked on some things that have been successful, like this collection, which is really a collection for restaurants. And, you know, so it's, it's a... The fat collection, which has a, a dining chair and a lounge chair, all with this similar comfort part, and try to do that for the new way of working, which is uh, basically sometimes at home, sometimes. Um, and, and there's no work chairs I can think of that um, you'd really want to have at home. So uh, we tried to convert this into a into a work a work chair. So that that was another project. Uh, but there, there were many. I mean, I'm not going to through. We did 20, right? So we don't have the time <laughs> to go through the whole lot, right? Um, uh, you know, changing times obviously calls for call for changes in in design. I'm wondering over the years in working with the A and D community and seeing the way that people use the things that you've designed or envisioned, has that had an impact on how you create what you create? I have to be careful what I say here, right? No, no, no. <laughs> this is all this about is, candor. No, but no. I, all the good people want to okay. hear the real. The real tea. No, I, I don't see the distinction between the AD and community and, and, and me. In fact, I am also the AD and D yes. community. We have, you know, we have an interior design studio ourselves, and that's been, you know, the, the, the best laboratory for knowing what the right brief might be or the right um, object that's missing from an interior design. So, you know, I, you know, we're all together in this, and you know, so so it's 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 you know intrinsic, and we do kind of fifty percent um, to you know, domestic consumers, maybe mainly wholesale, so, you know, the general public, and then 50% into professional projects. So right. the stuff is made, you know, in that kind of uh, overlap between the professional and the, and the domestic. And so it's all tested to professional standards for contract. And, you know, the, the A&D community are the toughest clients, so they give you the best briefs, right? Is that... That's all okay? new out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I assume there's an ecosystem of ideas between your interiors practice and uh -huh. your product design practice. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, building things, creating things, designing things that, that you see fill a void in a project or, you know, how, I, I, I'm curious about the structure of the studio and, and how ideas sort of move between uh, the various arms of the Tom Dixon empire. Okay, well, you know, I, th I think, you know, I started off this project really so I didn't have to, to worry about you know, what other people wanted me to make, you know, so it's kind of, you know, the, the, the very idea of having my own eponymous label was partly to do with not being a very good designer in terms of, you know, reacting to, to, to briefs, right? So I'm not very good at being told what to do. And so half of the reason for having my own label is so that I don't need to be told, right? Um, but having said that, you, you, you need to put yourself in situations where, you know, ideas, you know, flourish and, and, and you get input. And the best input is from a live project rather than, a, you know, a, a, a nominal brief. You know, when you're in a company, and I've worked in, in big companies as well, the tendency is always to say, well, you know, this did really well last year, we need another one of those, right? So that, that's the general mentality of, let's say, a sales force or the rest of it. It's like, this was really successful, the sales are dropping, we need another one. Um, and, and the reality of, of, of A&D is that they're reacting to the future. Uh, you know, they're doing projects which will be used in six months or in a year, so that, you know, you guys are the, are the you know, are the sensors for the future, and, and you're, you're trying to solve the problems of how we live now, um, and, and what's going to be used in six months or a year. So, you know, for me, uh, having live projects and having conversations with, um, with, with designers that are doing spaces, particularly spaces in sectors I'm not familiar with, is the way that we, we, um, we think of, of ideas, you know, because we have to solve a problem. And in your interior design practice, what is the range of commercial, residential, what types of projects um, are you tackling, say, now in the studio? We're doing um, uh, kind of affordable first living um, uh, in, in Scandinavia with maybe you know, six sites in Finland and Denmark and, 
and Sweden, which is called Unity, which is you know this new idea of, of quite constrained and affordable uh, living spaces and then shared um, communal spaces and services, right? So that's you know the way that residential is going for a lot of people that can't afford um, big spaces, and it's been you know very very interesting to try and crack the problem of how you can um, particularly. Uh, um, uh, predict uh, all of the different forms that the family will take because you know I think what's what's obvious about what's happening now is that people move a lot more you know possibly now 17 or 18 times in a lifetime versus three even 20 or 30 years ago right mm -hmm. so people are more mobile the shape of families change all the time and and having housing stock which uh, reacts to that is quite a tough a tough brief so that's been a, 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 an amazing one we've got um, opposite thing, a luxury garage for, for car nuts in Tokyo, you know, with a, with a club for people to have their cars so they can show it to their friends. So, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum. There, those are two current ones. Well, I always find it interesting and gratifying when designers can, you know, swing both ways, as it were, from luxury. I yeah, know, I know. Um, <laughs> uh, from luxury to things that you know, have a real um, element of social responsibility. And the idea of smaller housing, mm. especially for someone who lives in LA and goes to see, you know, bloated McMansions and McModerns, you know, one on top of the other with dead space in them that nobody, you know, the idea of smaller living um, and what did you call it? First living? Is that a category? Well, well I think we might be calling it micro living, but I don't micro know. Micro living. Yeah. I, yeah. And it's called unity? I know it sounds like a cult. I'm kind of into it. I'm kind, I'm, I'm kind of yeah, into it. No, that, designing a cult might be the next good project. Yeah, um, right. yeah. uh, I, would, I would mind living in like a Tom Dixon cult commune setup. Um, uh, talking about social responsibility, I mean, we, you know, we talked. Uh, for a moment about sustainability, but you're working and experimenting with many different kinds of materials. Um, these days, I was particularly fascinated by the mushroom, the mycelium, how do you pronounce that? I should have learned. Mycelium, yeah. Mycelium. <laughs> Can you tell us about some of these experiments? Well, you know, mushrooms are the hot topic right now. I'm sure everybody's experimenting with mushrooms here in, in LA. I in, am in right a, in now. A, in a medium. <laughs> You know, so, but also, you know, in biotech, not just, you know, microdosing, but, you know, the, it's, it's become a subject, right? And, and you know, the, this invisible world of mushrooms, which happens underground, is the mycelium. So that's the roots that, that join all the mushrooms that just are the, uh, you know, almost like the flowers that pop up from this amazing hidden world. So I'm sure everybody's read about it. But what's kind of interesting is how many potential problems it can be solving um, with this thing which has always been there. And I think the, um, the modern world isn't really about graphene or, you know, all of the amazing new materials that are synthetic. It's really about thinking of new ways of using um, existing materials and mycelium is the, the perfect example so we're working with an American company actually that's, um, that's uh, really um, spent most of its time trying to um, substitute polystyrene packaging so you know single use plastic being one of the big crimes against uh, materiality um, is, is something they've managed to um, replace. And a lot of experiments in, in new materials are just too expensive for designers to really use in more than a conceptual way. Um, so what's kind of nice about people that are trying to do packaging is that they're making um, the stuff really affordably with farm waste, in this case hemp um, chaff, and, and uh, inoculating it with the mycelium. And they do all kinds of things with this, this thing that they're working also on on uh, non non animal leather, for instance, and uh, as as a as a natural consequence of that, also bacon, you know, matrixes as well. Um, but basically, we wanted. Wait, I'm to sorry. Did you say bacon ma matrix? Vegan vegan bacon. Well, you know, all oh. of these things share that the you know leather and yes. the bacon share a kind of texture, which is you know, which is quite similar, right? So it's kind of fascinating that the, you know this company, which started off with with packaging, is also looking into all of these other possibilities as well, and it just shows the breadth of, of possibilities, but we're trying to use uh, the mycelium both for upholstery, um, but also for um, the, the less uh, uh, 
uh, urgent need of, of scent diffusers. So rather than making tiny uh, scent diffusers with nasty little reeds that gather dust, we've made these huge architectural columns which are really destined for airports or large lobbies you know, where, where we're using the mycelium as a scent diffuser. So we're not exactly saving the planet with that, but um, you know, the, the, the research into these materials and what we can do with them will, will, will accelerate our possibilities in, in, in making you know, quite a lot of our range slightly less impactful on the planet, I think. It's so interesting the, that you're working in the area of scent. Um, and mushrooms. Yeah. And, and mushrooms. And, well, I mean, what you were saying about the packaging being, you know, a great example is, you know, the great California marijuana boom and the marijuana boom all over um, this country is that, you know, the amount of packaging for one tiny bud is insane, like the amount of glass and plastic. And, um, and so it's, I find it fascinating that you're, you know, m that those concerns sort of transcend whether it's a chair or a, you know, or something that you're eating. By the way, I'm desperate for a BLT right now um, after you've talked about that. Uh, but tell us a little bit more about these scent diffusers because I'm fascinated. I'm trying to picture them in my mind. Um, well, it's a shame we don't have the, the pictures. I'm used to having pictures to talk to. But yeah, I mean, they're tall, they're columns. They might be neoclassical almost, but they're just a stack of, of, um, of modules. I mean, the, the mushroom, is, it's more like cooking. You're, you're almost like baking a cake. So you, you have to make things in a, in, in a mold and, and the, the, the mycelium kind of creeps into the gaps in between the, 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 the hemp um, and, and actually holds it all together. But you're, you're basically making it almost like a cake. You're keeping them warm and, and then you kill them, you know, uh, by heating them a bit more. And, and then it becomes rock solid with a velvety surface, which is kind of quite attractive. And, and uh, that's it, really. Wow, that sounds fascinating, amazing. Uh, tell me about manufacturing and changes in 3D modeling and rapid prototyping and how all of these technologies come to bear on what you do? Well, you know, the, the whole thing, you know, my whole life in, in design, oh my God, is, um, <laughs> has been um, driven by a, a kind of fascination in how you make things, whether that's craft or industry, I don't really make the distinction. And, and so, you know, I, I get obsessed with, with uh, manufacturing technique. You know, I started off welding, which was an amazing way of making things really quickly. And I still prefer that kind of um, uh, way of prototyping, which is to make full size models and really before you go to the computer as you're trying to see how an object inhabits space and how it's constructed right so that's the method really and then you know a lot of the inspiration comes from factory visits you know by having my own label I'm you know I visit every factory that we make things and that's all over the world it you know, might be Viet Vietnam or it's Poland or the UK well, you know a lot of the ideas come from talking to the craftsmen or the engineers that know so much more about how you make things and then, you know, the, the, the rest of the thing is, is a lot of really nightmarish work to get around uh, uh, lots of restrictions in, in terms of uh, uh, import restrictions or, or eco restrictions or, you know, all kinds of different, you know, a whole year of, of the product cycle is taken up with certification for things like lighting or, 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 or things like perfume are quite difficult to get into California because everything that you put into scent is in principle poisonous if you ingest lots of it, you know. So, you know, California's tough and California um, has been really difficult to get things into. But the interesting thing about California is how it's kind of influenced the whole world into much better behavior in a couple of things, specifically LEDs are, are the thing that um, I've been interested in watching, you know, something which was really unfashionable and, and unliked by designers and by the public, too expensive as well, being forced to change into something attractive and interesting. And, and for us as designers, it's been amazing to work in a completely new field of illumination and use these LEDs and, 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 and have the public you know, thrashed into, into using them. And eventually the whole world, because California insisted that you had to have intrinsic LEDs before you could sell a lamp. And that's been one of the interesting big I'd say success stories in sustainability over the last few years. 
Are, are there other countries where you manufacture that you think are particularly progressive or avant-garde in their approach to um, issues of environmentalism, sustainability, product? Well, I mean, not so much countries, but certain sectors. You know, I mean, you know, I've been obsessed with cork recently, which is, you know, obviously another, you know, readily available material. So Portugal, you know, has has been nurturing its cork forests, even in the face of, you know, bottle corks, you know, particularly in California, being replaced by plastic and by screw tops and all of the horrible things. But in Portugal, the the the, the cork industry is still there, and of course, you know. The, industry is, is characterized by a really long-term view in nurturing a forest, right? Which is quite unusual in terms of, of, of an industry altogether. So it takes maybe 27 years before you can crop you know, the first bark off a cork tree, and then you can only do it every seven years afterwards. So people that plant um, cork trees are, are doing that for the next generation anyway. And the material in itself is, is um, a carbon sink, you know, so you've got this material which is a really traditional material for Birkenstocks or for wine bottles or for fishing floats. It's been around forever, but it's now being used for all kinds of things, including um, the American space race, where it's being used to shield astronauts from coming back um, and burning in the atmosphere because it's an amazing insulating material. So cork's my current obsession, and so in terms of, of progressiveness, I think that the companies that are working in that have got a you know, a really old-fashioned view, which is very progressive, you know. But you've been working with cork for some time now, yes? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I have you, now, yeah. When, when you look, you know... Nobody wants to buy it, though. This is an interesting thing. You know, with, is that with, true? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, we, we, we you know, specifically launched this collection in, in a pandemic, and it's quite a hard material to, you know, to project uh, digitally. In, you know, it's got a real texture to it, which, you know... And I think still in our business, people, um, people need to kind of see, feel, and even possibly smell things before they, they buy them. You know? Right. Um, so interesting. When you... You know, looking back, and I shouldn't be saying this in the, with with a, a digital a digital platform, but it's quite interesting to to see a, a, a digital business wanting also to do you know a, a physical event as well with real people in yeah. a real room. So that's kind of nice also to be back, um, you know, back in a room with people on the west coast. It's kind of great. This is all travel. virtual reality. Oh. <laughs> this okay. is all this is virtual. Dystopian. Okay. This is all virtual reality. Um, when you when you look back over all the things that you've designed, are there a few uh, pro particular projects or designs that you think were, were turning points or inflection points in how you think about design? You're, ch you're, you're asking me to choose my babies again. I right? am, uh, you know. I, mm. I'm just gonna say, if I had children, I would clearly have a favorite, and I wouldn't, <laughs> be, it's probably a good reason not, for, for not to have children. But I, I'm just curious, you know, in your own mind, like, like the milestones, the major. Yeah, I mean, you know, I talked about the S chair earlier, and that's something which, you know, was transformational because it started off as a piece of, of um, furniture which I made out of scrap pieces. It had a, a steering wheel for a base from a car and, and a rubber inner tube from a tire. And, and it was the one that, that um, was the first one I started making myself in, in serial production, um, but then got taken up by a, an Italian company called Capellini and then ends up at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. You know, and so you know, that's the one that, 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 that kind of uh, marks various stages of, of, of my career, I guess. And then you know, there's other things that I kind of prefer from an aesthetic point of view, a chair called the Pylon Chair, which was a kind of failed attempt at the lightest metal chair in the world. And then um, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's more than I care to mention, which are, are significant. But um, what's your next question? OK. What <laughs> <laughs> what haven't you designed that you would be super stoked if oh somebody said, please, you know, yeah. Tom Dixon, design this? I don't know. I mean, that's a question that I get asked, you know, fairly frequently. But, you know, the beauty of being a designer is that, you know, design is such a kind of elastic term. It's, a, it's not a thing. It's something that you apply to other people's worlds or, or other people's, you know, um, businesses. You know, so you... you, you um, you can have endless adventures in design, and I've only touched on a few of them. I've never done any electronics. I've never built a bridge. I've only done one house in, in my life. I mean, I'd love to do more 
um, more apparel. I've done that one time, and you know, I learned how to do it through the project, and now I need to do it again. Um, but you know, I think you know, the, the, the more, more importantly, there's, there's any amount of things that um, require urgent attention, which, which, which I should be designing, which I don't often get the chance. And um, you know, so if there's anything I can do in this, in this, in this, uh, you know, uh, online talk, is to plead for um, uh, tasks that are, are more relevant to you know, a rapidly changing world that really needs some design solutions right now. You know, I think I could do better in terms of, of doing things that really count. Yeah, I can do another chair, you know, mm -hmm. but um, it'd be nice to you know to, to contribute a bit more. And maybe you and uh, Brittany's rubber maker can come up with something. Yeah, more latex. <laughs> yeah, that, that might, yeah, that might help. No, yeah. that, always, that always helps. Where do, where do you, you know, I, the work evinces this incredible curiosity about form, material, shape, all of that. Where, where do you look, um, you know, are you in a, a, a the dreaded social media. Where, where do you look to kind no, of get the I think, creative I think, oh, juices? The social going. media is dangerous, right? Because you know it's the sort of thing that <clears throat> can can start making you doubt that the idea is yours anymore. You know, I think it's really. You know, I love using it. I'm running five accounts myself. You know, but and and I love the the constant assault of inspiration. But it's quite dangerous in terms of not really knowing your own mind. I mean, I was very fortunate to be pre-social pre, uh, media in, in terms of designers. So you could be anonymous for a really long time, which is, you know, which was both hell and purgatory, but was also much better in, in terms of being able to define a more unique aesthetic. And I think it's really difficult for people to be, um, to be unexpected now and, and different, more difficult, if you like. So, it's extremely difficult, um, You think. know, the positive thing is it's much, much easier to get out there if, if you do. So where do I go for inspiration? I, you know, I try and put myself in unusual, unexpected and uncomfortable situations. And, um, and that usually allows me to think of something new, you know. Mm. And, um, you know, inspiration often comes from uh, disparate sources combining together. And, you know, so, I mean, even you know, we, we run a, a restaurant in London, we have our own restaurant that, that might be working in the kitchen would give me an amazing view of a restaurant from uh, the chef, the chef's perspective, and so that that would be a great place to have design ideas, for instance. Right? I'm I'm astonished that you've done one house. Is I know. I know. It's not, um, it's not right. Uh, but surely <laughs> some fair. of that must be by, you know, the way you choose to funnel your energies. No, um, that's a complete. It's, it's a, bit a mistake. You know. I mean, I I, I don't know. I I think it's. Um, I think people pigeonhole you quite quickly. You know, I've been many different designers. I've been the person that does, you know, scrap scrap furniture. I've been, you know, creative di director for a big corporate firm. I've been, and so you get pigeonholed very quickly. And people think you can only do chairs at the moment. They think I can only do lights. So, you know, please give me another house. Okay. I mean, I think you know, it's nice doing products and it's nice doing interiors, but you want to do the outside as well and, and, and the thing that contains everything. Of course, you know, you're supposed to have a certificate to do these things, right? Oh, yeah. And you have to study for seven years to, to be an architect, right? So, you know, you know the architects hold on to that, you know, that, that very tightly. Yeah, I suppose, but I imagine there are workarounds. Um, uh, <laughs> Well, I, for one, would be excited to see more full-scale houses from you. I'm always excited to see new product, new experiments, and that's, as I said, when people ask, you know, who do you admire, who do you respect? I respect people who are always keeping their antennae up for um, what's happening in the world, how design meets what's happening in the world in, in, in every way, materials, how designers interact with the product, all of that. I'm not going to ask you a like crystal ball legacy question because I bet you'd be super annoyed if I did. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, instead I will just wrap it up and say it's great to have you in Los Angeles. We'd love to see uh, more of you here. Thank you to Tom Dixon. Thank you to the, everyone at Lumens for uh, bringing us together for this event. And everyone, have a great evening. Yeah. And <laughs> well,
It's called Save the King, right? God Save the King. Apparently. Exactly. Yeah, right. Thank you, everyone.